notes in it. You'll, otherwise, you guys would have to find out just how heavily I rely on my notes. Um, okay. Okay, I got tons of places to go, but we can open up to questions first to y'all. Um, and yes, I know we didn't get to the last blank. Thank you, Jake. Questions or, or anything from this morning? In the back. So, for you all that don't know me well, I am a glass half empty kind of guy. Um, just ask Anna. Um, so, last couple of Sundays, the sermon has alluded to unity. Um, and my immediate knee jerk has been if it's up to the body of Christ, as a whole, to, um, uh, you know, as, as it said today, we're being used to accomplish God's glory in Christ. Anyway, what I'm getting at is I don't feel like we're doing that great of a job with you hundreds think? of denominations. Yeah. And yeah. So any words of wisdom to get that glass half full? Sure. I think, I think it's always important for us to think locally. Um, What can I do about the global unity of the church? Not much other than struggle and strive and labor to be faithful here. So as much as we think of the church universally, I think 80% of the New Testament references are to the local church. So like move forward in Ephesians. So my first thought, so move forward in Ephesians. All of Paul's so what's, even though they incorporate universal church truths are all applications in the local church. So in chapter 4, um, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. Um, that's not talking about me bearing with one another with people in, in Tehran or China or you know California. Keep, keep going. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And again, that's going to be local. Um, as he goes on to make clear, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one um, hope that belongs to the Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we are to uh, walk with humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. But that's all done locally. So the first thought would be, if you look at the global issue, there's not much that we can do about the fracturing globally of the church. What we can do something about is right here. Then, by extension, we could start to do something with other churches in our region. Pastor Daniel and I, this, this Christmas season has been really busy, but regularly meet with three or four pastors in the area who are like-minded. Um, we've, we've done some co- cooperative ministry with some of them. I've spoken at uh, like Redeemer and Jason girl has spoken at our dodgeball days. And, and, um, we ever, we had both the pastors have gone. I don't know who the new pastors are at grace in Indianola, but we were, we were some like, but all it's an attempt to start doing some of this, but it's got to start locally. It's got to start here and then we can start moving it out. Um, The other thing that's difficult, though, is, as I was saying this last week, Paul, as much as he stresses this, is also equally clear we can't compromise over doctrine. We've got to figure out which doctrines are first order, second order, third order, and so on. But we, there's a, a, the the liberal wing and the the wisdom of the culture wants, you know, you've seen those coexist signs, would have us Muslims, um, Mormons, Jewish, Catholic, all in one big service. Well, there'd be plenty of unity, but you'd lose is truth. <laughs> and so the challenge is unity with an in-truth. Um, so worship styles are negotiable. Sermon times and service times are negotiable. Um, the, the location's negotiable. What's not negotiable is truth. So the challenge is... And, and so you can, you can have unity very simply if you jettison truth. And if you just hammer the truth and don't care about unity, well, you can be you can have a church of three people, you know, and and sometimes there are churches of three people because that's all there are. Sometimes there are churches of three people because, you know, this guy, his wife, and his kid are the only people who can agree on all their points of doctrine. Um, I've even heard about some of those tiny churches splitting. 
No, but well, no, it makes sense. When you're that persnickety about everything, what are you going to do if you find out one guy actually thinks something slightly different? Well, you're going to divide again. So the challenge is truth and unity, and, and it's difficult to do that. So yeah, I look at the Protestant Reformation, and I say amen. Now, the, the outside of the Protestant Reformation is we've got, what, a couple thousand Protestant denominations? And to the degree that that's over crucial issues of truth, I mean, I just heard that the Methodist church is going to be splitting. Amen. Amen. I mean, it would be far better if the entire Methodist church agreed with Scripture on those issues. But, I mean, go to, go to 1 Corinthians 11, where Daniel was at earlier today for, for communion. Um, there are divisions that are necessary. Verse 18. First Corinthians eleven eighteen. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So here's a division so that those who are at the very least are holding to a historic biblical teaching on, on the issues of, of gender and, and homosexuality and things can be recognized. That, that portion of the Methodist church will be recognized and evident. Here's the portion, at least on those issues, is being biblically faithful. Good, right? I mean, they've tried working on it. It's clear they're not going to win the other side. So now there has to be a division. And so on the one hand, the fracturing of Christ's church is good. But sometimes what you're seeing is the removal of the living portion from the dead portion. Right? Um, and so what do you do? You, the Lord's in charge. He, he will shepherd his church. He'll build it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And yet you look around and you're like, okay. <laughs> so I'll let the Lord handle the macro level. Like, Wherever you or I have chance to do something at the macro level, by all means, do it. I don't expect to be invited to some like global conference. Uh, I think that's highly unlikely. And so I do think there's plenty we can do at the local level, which is where I think the overwhelming majority of the instruction is. So that, that would be just my notion is I, I want to see Martinsdale Community Church and then maybe some overflow into the churches in the community have some unity and some like-mindedness. I don't expect to achieve much more in my lifetime. Jacob. Um, the Catholic Church uses the uh, divisions that exist as an indictment against the church, basically like we were all one big church and then people started reading the Bible for themselves and now look what has happened. And you have factions and different mm-hmm. denominations. I think it's important, like you said, the truth versus unity. Yeah. Because we can see now that the Catholic Church has made a big play for unity at the expense of truth. Truth. You got it. Absolutely. No, no, precisely. Hey, we'll just tell you what it means. Well, you're going to have unity around that, right? Um, you may not have what it means, but you'll have unity. Fair, fair enough. No, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any other? I mean, but but no, um, Jamie. I, I echo your concerns. It is it is disheartening to see what's going on, to see what's going on, and thankfully that's where like there's the Lord, the Shepherd of His flock. I mean, so in, in First Peter, he talks about the elders being under shepherds. I'm really glad that, that there's a there's a chain of command that goes far above me and Allo Strand or the other elders here, and there's a sovereign God who knows what He's doing. Regardless. Jesus, Paul, and the Bible, like you, you guys really need to emphasize and prioritize being at peace, being unified. And, but in the initial instance is right here. You know? um, so we should just probably like, okay, God knows what he's doing. We should probably work really hard at being unified. But I, I get your point. It is, I mean, that's what they were trying to stop with the Reformation. They were trying to not sp- splinter the church. That's how penance came about, was to stop the church from splintering in the 4th century. Greg. Well, I think some, sometimes we're not as... Uh, I mean, we look inept in being unified uh, as a church. Uh, and, and in truth, we, we are in many cases... But I think we sometimes look at the enemy and think, well, 
the enemy is all lined up side by side. Uh, but we have to remember, first of all, I don't think that's true. I, I think the enemy is just, a, you know, against, uh, but they're not all against the same thing. But they just appear to be unified. But remember that they have, they have Satan, uh, the ruler of this earth, leading them mm. or, or uh, orchestrating uh, splinters of groups that have otherwise don't even know th- who they are. Uh, that makes them look unified because they're all receiving marching orders, even though they don't know it, from. Uh, Satan and his demons, and yeah. and uh, and and while we have the Holy Spirit, we, we are our goals are to to be a unified body that right. loves God, and I don't think our our goals are to be a unified body that loves other churches, right. uh, or that uh, in, I mean, to the extent that we can be, I think that's great, but I don't think that's a high priority. Right. Well, with, in that regard, it's largely you either find them or you don't. There's not a whole lot you can do getting unified with another body who doesn't want to get unified. So when Daniel and I meet like-minded pastors and elders, it like, really seems like we're on the same page. Awesome. Let's try to maybe do some stuff together. But where you meet people who, well, we got some stuff in common, we don't. Unless everybody involved wants to and has the time to start working on stuff, I, I'm in no position to demand it. I mean, it's hard enough getting together with guys I'm of like mind once a month for lunch. You know, it's, it would take a lot of work to really... And there are stories of churches who've done that, but it's, it's, it's not... Again, that's not what we're called to do primarily in the New Testament. Primarily in the New Testament, it's in the local church level. Oh, there you are. I thought it was Renee. Were you raising your hand? I, it's a peripheral vision thing. So. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Yeah. As we talk, as you talk about being unified yeah. here, um, I'm just thankful for the articles of faith, and you know it's a good time to, you know, look at those and uh, encourage one another and oh. and have conversations, uh, so that if there is any concerns, right. that there's opportunity to be of one mind. And then in Philippians 2, um, you know, we're commanded to be of one mind so it's possible. Amen. But by the way, a public service announcement. You heard me mention in the fall, back around the beginning of school, planning on doing a a couple week sermon series dealing with um, homosexuality, abortion, transgenderism. That's still in the works. Um, It it seems to be, even with this Methodist split, even more... um, in the, in the culture and in the church, but it probably will be another few weeks till we get that thing going. Fall is much busier than I thought it would be, and with something as important and touchy as that topic, you want to speak fully, clearly, you want you want the thing fully baked. So, God willing, that'll be coming out, I guess it would be February, and um, I don't know if we still have copies of Love Thy Body in the bookstore, but I really recommend that. Um, I know others here have read that and enjoyed that, but but uh, it's it's an excellent. A lot of a lot of what I've got coming at, a lot of my thinking is coming out of that book. It was very helpful to uh, Nancy Piercy. Helped show some real unifying commonalities on those issues um, that I thought was excellent. So if you're looking for something to read, you can read that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Oh, who? Yo. Oh. Hello, Anna. Sorry. Hi. This is the problem with it. The, it's more than 180 degrees. It's like 210. Easy. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I guess just adding on to what we've been talking about. Yeah. It's, it would be awfully hard to focus on getting together with more churches outside of ours um, if we were doing more work on connecting in unity with the people in our church body. Right. Um, Kind of like the concept of before you address your brother with sin, make sure to look inside. Right. Um, I, I mean, it is very discouraging to go into some cities and see there's a church, and then go over a block, there's another church. Right. Go over a block, there's another church. Um, but I think there's a lot of work we could be right. doing here right. in, in connecting with our members of the body and, and knowing them more. And I think 
um, when we focus on that and really um, do work to do that, those unity problems, they don't go away, but we become stronger and um, yeah. we as a body can do a lot of work in that area. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and even though Paul's letters, and some of them are circular, cyclical, going around, we know that this is going to more than one church in the region of Ephesus. Everything's at the local level. Even whereas the t- theological truth is at the macro level, because of what Christ has done for the entire church, you local church do this. That seems to be the, the flow of thought in nearly every epistle. So, like, okay, we local church will try to endeavor to do this. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, Pat, 190 degrees this way. Having served in southern Iowa now for about half of my life and watching so many little churches all over the place that kind of carry on their own thing, um, Jeremy, this is kind of somewhat of a um, promotion of what you and Daniel are doing. Um, one of the things that's been on our heart is to produce something that was biblically... Uh, sound and good that we offer. And, and right now we're just doing a staff training, but the Turger course that you, yeah. you guys teach. Um, <clears throat> it's just a great opportunity to, I believe, to uh, spread good Bible doctrine without being divisive. We're just basically going back to what the Bible teaches. Right. And uh, one of the things we've struggled with as a ministry is that uh, we're not there to uh, cause a lot of division, but we are there to uphold the truth. Right. And um, you mentioned the Methodist split, which I've been watching for some time now. And one of my passions this year will be to get camp literature out to as many of those Methodist churches as we can, because um, I think we can, if, if nothing else, hopefully pull in some young people right. eventually that will, maybe a generation later, will begin to influence things in uh, in the area, depending on what yeah. the Lord how he tarries, you know. So, In, indeed. Anyway, is anyone here not aware of the Methodist split? I can have mentioned it. Basically, the rest of the world's Methodist Church and America are at odds. Um, the Methodist Church is, I think, slightly most of the churches are in America, and the American Methodist Church is incredibly liberal. Um, whereas, I think the African Methodist Church is the most conservative wing, and they. Put, African and Filipino. And so they've been trying to hash out issues of gay clergymen and those issues for a number of meetings. And they've been trying to not fracture the Methodist Church. And I think they've finally just given up. Um, I think the American Methodist Church finally is done. You know, and as, as things heat up and you hate the other people and the other people are, it's hate speech, you know, I, I think they've just finally given up and they're splitting. Um, the Methodist Church will split. Now that's. Mo- that isn't going to change much for the American... If anything, it's going to free up most American Methodist churches to run much harder, much faster, and much more loudly in the direction of the culture. Um, the, the ones who are pulling out are the, the conservative wing. I think they're going to go by the name of the traditional Methodist. Traditional Methodist is largely going to be in Africa and the Philippines, not, not in America. But minimally it makes it a topic of conversation it makes it an issue that's coming up um and it's also is good in the sense that this was an untenable relationship and it's clear nobody's listening to anybody and there's no actual movement being made they just keep saying we're to put another five-year moratorium on deciding this issue well now yeah Nice. Well, that'd be a great conversation if you have Methodist friends. Hey, which which side is your church going to take? Are you guys going to go conservative? That'd be great. No, and, and yeah, here's a chance, though, for individual American churches to go and side with a more biblical uh, perspective. So, no, no, I, oh, I know there are, but, but, but largely that's not the case. There are the exceptions, no doubt, no doubt. Yes, Carol. I was just going to say, I, I asked uh, for prayer for a friend of mine uh, last year, two you remember, he, well, he has a brother who's a, a school teacher, but he's also a, a Methodist pastor down in a little town in southern Iowa. Very evangelical guy. Nice. And uh, when Kathy and I were in western Iowa, we went to a little Methodist church. A um, evangelical Pentecostal was the pastor, and um, 
uh, it's been our experience that the Methodists always take the evangelicals and put them out in some remote little spot, <laughs> as far away from the center as they can, but they're, they exist, all right. Yeah. Well, and it's also going to force um, the churches that haven't wanted to make, come out down on the decision, that have wanted to straddle the fence to make a decision, because they're going to have to either go with the traditional, or now that the, the, uh, the conservative element's no longer restraining them, you better believe the non-traditional Methodist church will fully articulate right into their statements their full affirmation of the LGBT plus agenda, which means each and every Methodist church on each corner is going to have to pick which way they're going. And so they're going to have to make a decision, have to go public on their belief. They can no longer say, well, we're still working through this. They're going to have to decide, which is also, I think, going to be good that these distinctions are made. If that's what you believe, say it. If that's what you believe, say it. And let the people in your church know it. Let the people considering going to your church know it. Say it, if that's what you think. And if you don't think that, say it. It's, I think that's a good development. Renee. Going off of the global thing and yeah. like the... the yeah. The big issues of like transgender and female pastors and that sort of thing. I think that just um, kind of echoing where my mind went when Jamie brought it up is that even in the United States and with pastors that are evangelical pastors, I feel like doctrinal pride is a big issue, is a big thing. And I think that you guys speak in tongues. We don't. I'm going to write a book on that and I'm going to be cheeky mm. about how I respond to that. And pretty soon it's how does that look to the world when, I mean, Ryrie and... Um, was, who was it, Ryrie and Piper, went back and forth. And then MacArthur. John MacArthur, okay, John MacArthur yeah. goes back and forth. And I'm just thinking, that doesn't show unity. Right. And when you say go home at a conference in front of a bunch of people, instead of like, I'll pray for her. Or, I mean, like, there's just a lot of issues that I see, like, even in the United States with people that we agree with. I just don't yeah. feel like love is the basis of, and unity right. might not be at the forefront of their mind. Right. Okay, there's a lot. Let me pick this bit. Um, I think I've, I can think of, I know you're, you're absolutely right. We can disagree agreeably and peaceably. We can disagree disagreeably. Let me speak of a positive example. I don't know if it's still in the bookstore, but Jake, you read Schreiner's book on spiritual gifts, right? So Schreiner, Thomas Schreiner, he, is he still at Southern? I don't know. Okay. He wrote a book against part of the second half of his book. First half of his book's just on um, spiritual gifts. He deals with tongues and prophecy at the end. It's the most peaceable disagreement that I've come across. And he dedicates the book to three continuous, Piper, Grudem, and uh, Sam Storms. And it's incredibly respectful, even as he makes a strong argument against it. And he talks in the opening about how he, these guys have influenced him. He loves them. And I think it's a really helpful piece of writing. I think it's a very helpful book. And it doesn't take away from his, the force of his writing that he's being peaceable. And... And so I greatly appreciate people who are being ironic, peaceable, in their disagreement. Um, and then there are, part of the problem is that even if you read Ryrie and MacArthur, I think Ryrie and MacArthur are pretty agreeable. If you read their actual books like So Great Salvation, The Gospel According to Jesus, in that instance, it's mostly the people who are reading them who are throwing mud in, for the most part. I'm not aware of MacArthur or Ryrie being tongue-in-cheek jerks to each other. And I've read both books on both sides. Um, generally, it's the people in the blogosphere a level down who are you know, pulling out cannons and blasting each other, um, which is unadvisable. Uh, um, and, well, I mean, unless you want to claim this is like a central issue. So Paul can use some pretty strong language in Galatians. I wish those people would emasculate themselves. That's pretty rough. Um, Paul's also made it clear this is a central gospel issue. If you get this wrong, you're severed from Christ and accursed. So, okay. Um, so, yeah, we, wanna, we want to have disagreements agreeably. I, I told you last week about a three-and-a-half-hour debate I had with a friend of mine. It was very peaceable, wasn't it? Sorry. Uh, yeah, this not so much, but but um, so yeah, it, it's it's all in how we approach things, and, and especially when our culture insists that if you disagree with me, really you hate me. We need to go above and beyond, I think, to make it clear. No, I can respect you and totally disagree with you. You know, I can respect you and um, think you're dead wrong, but we can reasonably and lovingly talk to each other. And unless I think you're not, I mean, unless I think your error is so dangerous and so pernicious that you know I need to treat you like Paul's treating the Judaizers. 
Um, I think we need to lovingly, uh, you know, talk, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, I just don't know enough about the whole go home. I'm not stepping into the go home thing whatsoever. Um, I'm dodging that one. Um, okay. Anywho, other thoughts on that? Oh, in the back. Uh oh. Oh dear. Now he's here. Here we go. Set your watches. Three and a half hours. <laughs> no. Um, no. I, I wanted to say I appreciate that you had an exhortation that was like it was. It was an aside in a point you were making, but about the primacy of the gospel over our defenses. And while we're supposed to always be prepared to offer a defense, the gospel has to be of first importance. So I just wanted to say I appreciate that. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, when you're when you're thinking through the connection generally, like what are some principles for how um, I guess like how people can balance like the desire to be prepared and keeping the gospel central? Sure. Um, the go- I, I think of think of a sword and a shield. The gospel is the sword. It's the offensive weapon for taking captives of dead men and, and bringing people to faith. The gospel is the power to salvation. Uh, the gospel doesn't need my defense to be active. Um, so, I mean, think of, think of Jonah, right? What type of defense, what type of miracles and signs and wonders did Jonah do? He did nothing. He showed up. He wasn't even, I'm guessing, terribly enthusiastic because he doesn't want them to repent. He doesn't want them to believe. He's going to throw a pity party precisely because, oh, God, I knew you were to forgive them. So, I mean, you can just, here's my impersonation of Jonah showing up to Nineveh. <sighs> okay, you guys got 30 days. I'm going to be on that hill. You know, I mean, that, that, I'm exaggerating, but, and the power of God is seen in Jonah without doing lots of miracles and signs. And I know people have suggested, well, they would have seen his bleach skin. The Bible doesn't talk about his bleach skin. We don't know how many days, months, or even years later he went to Nineveh. The text makes no connection with the Ninevites learning anything about Jonah and the fish. So I've heard people try to tell it as if somehow the miracle of Jonah surviving in the belly of the fish is what convinces the city of Nineveh. The text makes no such connections. Uh, The text does not connect those dots whatsoever. And so Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he preaches. He does no miracles. He clearly doesn't want them to believe, so it's not like he's shedding tears and he's pleading with them. And the entire town repents. Because the good news is the power of God to salvation. God's going to save people. Um, and, and so Paul can even say in prison in Philippians about people who are preaching the gospel to rub it in Paul's face. Paul's in jail now. Time to preach the gospel. Hey, Paul, make sure you send him a you know, postcard on my epistemic preaching. You know, and Paul's saying, hey, praise God, the gospel's getting out there. Why? Oh, they're not going to be rewarded for that, but they're preaching the gospel, and God's going to save people through that. So whether through genuineness or through false motives, I praise God that the gospel is being preached. So what I'm trying to to say, and I I said briefly, is you don't, in order to evangelize, you don't need to be able to answer every single question they come up with. There are other reasons to want to answer every question they come up with, but it's not going to... There's two dangers. For people like me who like to study those things and read up on apologetics and, you know, I went through phase, I went through a creation evangelism phase, and you can be tempted to think the wisdom of Jeremy is what is the power of God to salvation. And I got 15 really good arguments. I'm going to bring the cosmological argument out, and then when they don't have any, I'm going to bring out the teleological argument, and then we will bring out this. And there's somehow, like, my cleverness and my wisdom is what's going to, like, make them bow the knee to Christ. Who get the glory in that scenario? Me, right? Um, and so the Bible tells me I need, to, I need to be ready to give an answer, and I need to study to show myself approved. And I felt the shame of not having an answer to someone's question, feeling embarrassed. But none of that has any, any impact on whether or not the Lord is going to raise a dead person to life through his gospel. One man waters, one man plants. God makes it grow. So the one temptation is to become proud in our prowess, or we can do the same thing when we think, man, if we could just get you know, Billy Graham here, then people would get saved, as if Billy Graham is the power of God to salvation. We could just get MacArthur or Ryra, whoever, you know, Paul, whoever the famous 
evangelist is, right? Um, Billy Graham doesn't add to the power of God to salvation. I don't. The gospel, is, the gospel, as long as it's clearly communicated, is just as powerful whether it's done by the most eloquent or the least eloquent, by the most skilled and knowledgeable, by the newest convert. The, 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 Paul's insistent on that point. Now, apologetics is, I think, a sh- uh, the shield, it's defense. And in some senses, it, gives, it earns a right to get a hearing. They won't listen until, you know, you can silence John Piper's, not John Piper, John Calvin, different John. Um, apologetics is to silence the, mouse, the mouths of the obstreperous, which is to say God has declared that the wisdom of this world is foolishness, and a lot of apologetics is showing that. So when someone comes to him and says, oh, yeah, well, there's no truth, that's foolish. You just made a truth claim. That's self-refuting. I mean, there's a simple example. But that's not going to convert anybody. That might shut a mouth or two. And we can, we can give answers to questions, and we can um, show the wisdom of God, and we can show the folly of the thinking of the world. There is value to that, but it's, not the, it's defensive, it's not offensive. The simple declaration of the truth is all that is needed for the gospel to go forth. What's the phrase? The gospel's like a lion. You don't defend a lion, just let it out of its cage, it'll take care of itself. And so... You can read enough stories about people who've been brought to faith by the most unlikely witnesses. Um, Charles Spurgeon was uh, saved at the preaching of a guy he described as an ignorant. What was the scenario? He was going to he stopped at a church, and the pastor couldn't come, so some barely literate deacon was reading the same verse over and over about twenty times. Looked to me all the ends of the earth and be saved, and he's read it about twenty times and sat down, and. That's how God saved Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> well done. I mean, that's all the guy knew how to do, and he did it about 20 times, and he sat down, and look at that. I mean, um, and so the, the, apologetics is important, but not for the reason we're tempted to think it is, which is, man, them people get saved. No, proclaim, herald the gospel. Um, then people will get saved. And Prepare a defense to show the wisdom of God and the foolishness of this world. Make a defense to study the show so, so that we can be approved workmen of God who need to not be ashamed. I mean, I remember clearly, I mean, it still stings when I encountered a Jehovah Witness who was asking me questions, of, you know, I was in a park, and I was at Word of Life, we are doing street evangelism, I'm in a park, and, and he just would throw objections at me, and about the fourth one I didn't have an answer for, and he... He sort of looked at me and said, it's okay, keep studying, you'll get to the bottom of this. And I still, you know, um, and uh, (laughs) I, uh, you know, I'm looking for, I want to meet that guy again. I got an answer, you know. No, I still remember the text. I remember the text. It was John, right? Why do they say to me, you are gods? That's all I was talking about, Jesus being God. I was like, "Uh, I hadn't thought of that. He was like, just keep studying it, my boy, you'll be all right. You know, it just bugs me, right? Um, I felt a sense of shame that I wasn't prepared. I thought of, you know, any television programs I've been watching lately. And, ah, I should have been ready for that. You know, and there's a sense I'll never be, have an answer for everything. But that does spur us on, and it's a good motivator. Um, and it's good to show people in false religion the folly of what they're doing. That, that's, uh, that can be a loving and helpful thing. But they're totally separate things, even though in conversation they, they're frequently intertwined. Because frequently in a conversation, you talk for a bit, then they talk for a bit, and you are going to seem kind of rude if you're like, I have, I'm not going to answer any of your questions, I'm just going to keep heralding. The person's likely to say, well, I don't want to be heralded anymore. Thank you, right? <laughs> so there is a sense in which apologetics can earn a hearing, because if the person picks up, you just want to talk at them. Yeah, but what about, never mind that, and you keep, you know, it's, it's going to kind of seem rude after a while, right? Um, but in the same sense, just asking them how their day is going so to earn your right for hearing. But no, they're, they're totally separate things, even though frequently in our conversations they're totally intertwined. Jennifer. Can you give a little bit of some practical ideas of how you could respond to someone when they do bring up an apologetic question that you're not confident so that you don't come across of that way that you're just describing, but of how do you humbly and still genuinely respond to them of like, I don't know this. Do you have any thoughts or? I, no, I think it's just being willing to humble yourself. I, I've been humbled by other people's humor. 
So I was debating somebody on the ride back to Camp Good News. And I was, I was, my old, I've tried to, this was actually a very, very, very instructive, like paradigmatic watershed moment for me. My old form of debate. My dad was an attorney. My mom ran for state senate. Um, state senate, right, mom? Okay. Um, and so rational argument reasoning was big in my house. And so my methodology was to muster up arguments. And the second you didn't have an answer, now's the time to back the truck up and just dump, you know, like, Sort of like in box sports analogy, Greg. Boxing, you know, the guy's up against the ropes and he's, his guard's down because he's, he's a little stunned. That's when you just pummel him. That was sort of my argument style. Oh, you don't have an answer for that. What about this, 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 this? So I'm in the car and I'm, I'm, I'm discussing with one of the counselors um, something. And they said to me, I, I know that they taught me this when I was at school. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember what they said but I do think there are answers to what you're saying, and if you give me some time, I'll get back to you with them. And that's the right answer. And that was incredibly humbling to me because it, I realized what a spot I was putting them in. I was communicating, if you cannot now, in this moment, answer my question, then yield the point to me. And so I've tried to now more say, hey, can you think about this and get back to me? You know, um, giving, letting, even letting someone know up front, I'm not going to ask you to give me an answer this moment. I want to uh, let me let me give you two or three points to consider and think about, and I would like to know what you think about them. But take a, so you've, I'm even telling them in advance. I'm not going to finish talking and say, "So now what?" You know, but what that person did? Why, why can't we say that? It's just our pride. I don't. I don't know. That's a good question. I'd like to look into that and get back to you. I, I, no one's going to sneer at you. Well, maybe they will, but so that'd be the first thing: is just being willing to say that. I remember when your twin brother. I'm not used to this happening. Usually, this, that sounds arrogant. Usually, usually when we're doing Bible tough men classes, most topics people can bring up, I'm not saying I'm copiously competent in every topic, but it's rare that something comes up I literally have never heard of. And when your brother, we were talking about Angel, always says, what about Abaddon, the keeper of the bottomless pit? And I'm just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. He's like, you know, in Revelation, right? Still no idea what you're talking about. Abaddon, the keeper. <laughs> Matthew knew all about Abaddon, the angel of the bottomless pit. I didn't. See, there's another one. See if they're memorable. I remember this one, too. Um, and, and so you just got to say, I've, I need to study up on what you're talking about. I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that one. So that'd be the first step. It's just being willing to say that. D- don't feel like you have to have it. If you don't have an answer, don't fake it. Just be like, that's a great question. I will, I'd, I'd like to get back to you. And I think that type of humility will probably actually make them listen to you or encourage them to listen to you when you do talk to them. And then you've got the Internet. You've got your Bible. Well, let me start with the, You've got your Bible. You've got, <laughs> you've got the Bible. You've got others in the body of Christ. You've got leaders and elders and people. And frequently people will ask me questions about things. Um, Mitchell was just asking me a question about a text you were having a discussion with someone about, right, with Isaiah 7? Yeah, um, and so that's what we use each other for, because I may not have studied something, but somebody else has. And you know what I did with Mitchell? I remember my brother-in-law did a paper on that, so I wasn't, this, I, I wasn't ready to give an answer on this question, what is Isaiah 7, but I knew somebody else who did, and I texted my brother-in-law, hey, can you send me that paper? My brother-in-law sent me the paper on Isaiah 7, I gave it to Mitchell, and the body of Christ helps strengthen itself, right? So my brother-in-law's research in seminary in Isaiah 7, hopefully, is able to give some benefit to Mitchell, witnessing to his friend who asked a question. I mean, these are the types of things we can do. You've got tons of resources in the body. You don't have to, in that moment, be ready for everything. Even though we should be preparing and, you know, and, uh, and some of it can be foresight. If I know what venue I'm going into, I'm going to prep up. So when we, when we had an open door at Simpson, it was all about text, text critical, inerrancy, canon, because that was where the attack was, was on, and the intelligibility of the Bible. Can the Bible be understood? Is the Bible the Word of God? So you get some idea of what types of questions are going to come your way. And so you try to, it doesn't mean you prep for, you aren't ready for every question, but you can try to use some wisdom. If you're in whatever context you're in, what types of questions will be coming your way, you can try to prep for, but just being willing to uh, say, I don't know, let me get back to you. And then utilizing the resources God's given you in the body is the simple best advice I can give. I mean, are we looking for anything beyond that? I mean, then, of course, there are individual books you can read on topics of things and, and stuff. But I, the, the body of Christ is a rich, rich resource. 
and uh, just asking for help. And I know that can be so hard for some of us. Help. But, Greg. Well, I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> uh, put a do- uh, bow on this a little bit. Uh, uh, Jennifer's question is is one that is asked a lot, or, or yeah. it reflects something that a lot of us mistakenly do, which is to assume that we have to have the answer. Yeah. If you walked up to a rocket scientist who is always, the, the, these are the people that are always assumed to be the smartest people in the world, and you said, how long would it take to get to Mars? And he said, well, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to figure that out. You wouldn't go, oh, well, you know, you're not much of a rocket scientist. You would recognize, well, well, he's got a lot of information and he knows how to get the answer, but he doesn't walk around with it. Uh, so to, to assume that we need to do that or we're not right. credible or, or we shouldn't be out there talking to people because what if they ask questions that we don't have the answer for? Uh, it would make us look uh, foolish or whatever. Well, I don't, I don't think that's really true. I mean, right. uh, and, you know, and then the also then to back to what you were talking about earlier, uh, as an encouragement also to to not wait until you think you're prepared. Look at Jonah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Jonah wasn't prepared. Good grief. I mean, Jonah, um, not not you, Jonah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. We don't know. Yeah, well, we don't know. <laughs> okay. But, but, but Jonah was not, he wasn't even wanting to be prepared, right. much right. less trying to get prepared. Right. Uh, and yet he. All of Nineveh came to faith. Well, why is that? Well, because it wasn't about Jonah. It was about uh, the Holy Spirit uh, changing their minds. Uh, And so we need to recognize that as well. It isn't us that does it. Uh, uh, Whether we're uh, one of those ignorant elders that comes alongside you, Jeremy, when when you're incompetent uh, to talk to somebody. Or, um, you know, God will use all of us in whatever capacity to... Right. to uh, accomplish his will. Right, and you put a bow on it. Let me tie the bow. Ephesians, we'll get there in Ephesians 5, but Ephesians 5, this is precisely what we do. Um, God willing, our own Mitchell will preach, Serena's due Good Friday, which means it's likely Daniel will have the Easter service um, likely, not necessarily, just because she's due then doesn't mean she's going then, but her, her augmented due date for twins is Good Friday. And so Mitchell McClure I'm working with, hoping to help, help him, and his text is coming up. So, so Ephesians and Colossians have a lot of similarity in flow of thought. And there's, there's an interesting parallel. Ephesians 5, I'll read you um, in a moment the, flip, the Colossians version. But Ephesians 5, Look at what happens when the Spirit of God is in us. So, verse 15, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the result of the Spirit dwelling in us richly is not fundamentally seen in speaking in tongues or seen in signs and wonders. It's seen in the words that come out of our mouth is edifying to each other. The same thing is true in Colossians. You'll notice the exact same flow with one subtle difference. The reason I'm linking to Mitchell is Mitchell's text would lead into this. Um, let the word of Christ dwell on you richly. So in Ephesians, it's let this be filled with the Spirit. Here, let the word of Christ dwell on you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in wisdom, singing in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Whenever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we are to have the Spirit dwell on us richly. We're to have the word dwell on us richly. And when we do that, our speech and communication to each other will be this edifying mixture of Scripture, psalms and hymns and thankfulness and mutual submission. That's, that's ultimately how we're supposed to be conducting and, and unifying ourselves, get back even to the theme of unity. And in that context, the stuff you've been studying, maybe the, precisely the thing I need help for with, I mean, we, we will, the Lord is showing each and every one of us different things. And some of the insights he's showing you may not just be for you, but maybe for, um, you know, Steve or anyone else. 
And so as a body, we get strength and we grow up speaking the truth and love to ourselves. Anyway, thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, Glenn. No, Wanda. I think my question is too long. Um, I guess my sister goes to Methodist Church in Iowa City, which is enough said. Yes. And I just wonder, what does her pastor do with all of the scripture about gays? And I just am like, what do you do with that? We will talk about that next week. 